Hi, I'm Christy Pierce, and you're watching Mediaplex News Now YouTube Edition. At a conference, teachers and students learned about mental health disorders and the effect they have on learning in the classroom. April Colby has more. Adults aren't the only ones affected by mental illness. A presentation held Friday, February 11th at Windsor's Catholic Education Center helped raise awareness and educate teachers and students alike about the symptoms, causes and impacts of mental health disorders. Associate Director of Windsor-Essex Catholic School Board, Kathy Gemmel, says the event is the first of its kind, simulcast to eight secondary schools and their elementary feeder schools, with approximately 2,000 viewers. She says getting the message out to young people is crucial. We see so many young children now coming to us at seven, eight years of age, um, showing anxiety and depression, um, self-harm, even some of them who are taking antidepressants. There is the incidence of mental illness going untreated um, is only exasperated by the number of patients we see in the system later in life. Dr. Leonardo Cortese, Chief of Psychiatry at Windsor Regional Hospital, says the earlier these disorders are noticed, the easier the sufferer's futures may be. Educators who are essentially frontline workers, they have the possibility of uh, identifying these kids who may have some, uh, some clear problems and getting them in the right direction. And the literature has really shown that the earlier we can intervene and the, and the earlier we can get these kids in the right direction, the less difficult these illnesses will be in adulthood. Mental illness affects and impacts so many lives. But if we continue to learn and educate ourselves, that impact will only be lessened. This is April Colby, reporting for Mediaplex News Now. Mediaplex reporter Lauren Gayswinkler sat down with the Prince family of North Buxton to discuss Black History Month and their ties to the Underground Railroad. When you come from a community as rich in black history as North Buxton, February is just another month of the year. Brian and Shannon Prince are sixth generation settlers of the Elgin settlement, now known as North Buxton. The princes are descended from the Underground Railroad, a series of routes and safe houses that led slaves to freedom during the 1850s. In the Buxton area, farming is the traditional occupation, but agriculture is far from the prince's sole passion. A published author and historian, Brian Prince has always included black history in the upbringing of his children. Our household has had so much of a coloring of history to it because of the people Shannon and I have met along the way and they come to visit and we sit around our kitchen table and talk history. And the kids, um, although you think maybe they're not paying much attention, um, they certainly were. And it's really nice when you see them growing up and sort of sharing in that passion and, and asking the questions. And I think our lives have been so rich by our involvement in history. When Shannon was offered the position of curator at the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum in 1999, she quickly began to invest in the local history, often engaging in reenactments and performances. I tell people, you know, it's not just our history, it's everyone's history. And, you know, it should be celebrated every day, not just in February. And the influence of historical knowledge didn't end there. Christopher Prince, the eldest child, graduated university with a BA in history, despite beginning in the kinesiology field. It really kind of took over what I wanted to learn, and, and uh, they did have an influence on me taking that path just because it was, they always supported that. You know, my dad was, he's always been an author and, and always been a historian, so I mean, uh, he was my role model, someone to look up to, so it was kind of cool to have um, you know, one of the most knowledgeable black history historians in your own household, so you could always bounce ideas off him and always, um, you know, look for him for support and guidance. So, yeah, they d definitely had an influence on me. 
The familial interest in personal and local history extended to the prince's youngest daughter, Rebecca, a student at the University of Windsor. I'd love to do it um, on the side. I love participating at the museum, helping giving tours. Um, I gave a bus tour, I think it might have been a year and a half ago, and I, I really enjoyed it. I don't think that I had enough knowledge to really share with others, so I'd love to uh, still, as I said, learn more about the history. Through Brian's continual research and Shannon's involvement at the museum, the princes are able to trace their family ancestry back to South Carolina. Christopher and his sister both enjoy sharing in the history and anticipate teaching their own children. Yeah, so he, he always, you know, would tell us about uh, the different stories of us. And uh, yeah, seven generations later, we're still here and you hear the eighth generation. In the, <laughs> the Prince family hopes their involvement will help encourage others to look at black history as a national and collective history. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Lauren Gazewinkler. Lauren also met up with a couple from Cottom who made some interesting discoveries when renovating their home built in the late 1920s. When moving to a new home, a common question is usually, who lived here last? But what about who lived here first? Julia and Jeff Brown of Cottom, Ontario, purchased the home located at 111 Talbot Street West about seven years ago and started a business out of the home called Julia's Tea Room. Well, this is a great century-old home. It was built like in the turn of the century, uh, about 1902, I think, that we've got it kind of down pat, I think. <laughs> and um, plaster walls, it had like the, uh, the blow-in insulation. It um, didn't have really good wiring, only like one plug per room, and it was in the floor. And um, this house has, um, it's stood through many things. Last year, the Browns took advantage of the government home renovation tax credit and Jeff began renovations while Julia was teaching English in Japan. Well, we started to renovate this old house to fix it up and um, uh, we wanted to insulate better and um, improve the um, heating quality of the home. So we had a, the government grant for about $10,000 last year to do that. So we knew it was an old house, but um, as we started to knock the walls down to insulate better, we discovered a few things that were interesting. I discovered uh, these old newspapers and letters in the, in the wall, which were uh, really neat to discover because they told us the date of the house, which was like 1924, when it was built. Throughout the home, the Browns made numerous discoveries, including a dumbwaiter and two water tanks <laughs> supplying the house from an indoor well. You can see how, uh, how clean it is. That's just from the water table. The Kingsville Archives recently published a book compiling the history of the small community of Cottom and supplied the Browns with much of their research. One of the more now. interesting discoveries came from came behind a like baseboard on the house's main floor. Later I discovered a letter uh, from 1927 behind the baseboard from uh, the lady who lived in the house at the time, Mrs. Smith, her husband, or not her husband, her son had mailed it to her from Detroit and uh, he talks in the letter about um, not being able to make it home for Christmas and being sorry about that. And um, he talks about needing a, what he calls a dress being to be knitted for him now that it's getting cold. And I think by a dress he means a coat. But back then they just called it dress, I guess. We, don't, we use that word differently now. And then he talks about uh, Henry Ford bringing out his, his new car soon, which is probably a Model T. Um, which is interesting and then he talks about times being hard so uh, 1927 would have been right before the Great Depression or around the time of the Great Depression so that was interesting to read that. The Browns continue to look for more clues to the history of their home in order to include it in their menu when their tea room reopens. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Lauren Gazewinkler. In honor of Black History Month, a local group known as the Artists of Color held an art exhibit at Mackenzie Hall. I was there to bring you the details. I'm here today at the Awakening Creativity Exhibit, which is held every February in honor of Black History Month. The Artists of Color are hosting their fourth annual art exhibit at Mackenzie Hall. The exhibit features over 40 artists, ranging from the age seven and up from African descent. Um, our response is just what we anticipated was people said, I didn't know we had this talent or they might have known that person but didn't know they had that, that talent of art or drawing or painting. And so that was our goal to wake them up. And we try to keep a focus. Last year was uh, called uh, the courage of creativity. 
and it takes a lot of courage to step out and to create. Not only does Smith help organize the event, he has three paintings featured in the exhibit. He prefers working with acrylics, but teaches different mediums of art to adults and youth. The Artists of Color formed in 2008 and said they become dedicated to enlightening the community to works done by black artists. I get my inspiration from God. Um, he being the creator of all things, I, I feel when I take an empty canvas, it was like the empty world that we lived in. Um, and then I can just take anything and create from that. I was uh, with this torrid river. It's called the Raging River. I think that day my, um, I was angry. And uh, when I started painting it, I think you could see the rage of the water because that was my my inner being coming out. The exhibit is open to the public February 5th to the 15th and includes free admission. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Christy Pierce. How hot are these wings? They're so hot you need a waiver to try them. Laura Berry caught up with a brave soul who took the challenge. Chicken Bones Wing Shack is a dine-in or take-out restaurant here on Ottawa Street at the Market Square. It's home to the hottest wing in the world, and today, we're here to see if a hot wing hopeful can handle the heat. Approximately 200 people have tried their spicy hot novelty wing named the Death Wish. Served as a single wing on a silver platter, the wing is 100 times hotter than a jalapeno pepper, and applicants must sign a waiver before attempting to eat it. Well, we usually get probably about a dozen or so people a week uh, come in and try it. Um, as far as succeeding with the wing, uh, not too many do. Um, a lot of people can eat the whole wing, but uh, it, it's within that five minutes afterwards, they're in a lot of pain. It, it's, it's quite hot. Brave hot wing fan Ryan Dialwis came out to test the heat of the death wish. After the first bite, common symptoms kicked in like hiccups, tears, and some downright pain. But stupid hot. No one should eat food that hot, ever. My lips are burning, my mouth is burning, my heart is burning, my brain is burning. <sighs> Since opening the Wing Shack in July of last year, they have sold over 70,000 wings. With 99 flavors on their menu, their wing options are endless. Another one signed the waiver, another one tried to ink the wing, but it seems that no one can handle the heat of the hottest wing in the world. Reporting for Mediaplex News Now, I'm Laura Berry. Thank you for watching Mediaplex News Now YouTube Edition. I'm Christy Pierce.